That probably just showed up on the recording, me smacking my lips. So welcome to the big lip smack. I'm Jill and welcome to True North Insight and uh, our practice and um, Dharmat tonight. Okay, so uh, I was reading lately and uh, listening to, uh, it, it was the first time I'd heard of this thing of um but the university of toronto has um created this contract to this position and this person was being interviewed um their their title is that they're a special advisor on civil discourse <laughs> i was like wow first of all that sounds great and much needed and also curious i was like wow that's a that's a thing like civil discourse that they can teach and hold and guide and so needed it you know has arisen out of mm, so many things um so uh this person's name is randy boya boyagoda and he talks about how, you know, a, a, a classroom debate, it, it, they easily now and often escalate into screaming matches and guest speakers are hounded off the stage and uh, people feel afraid to express their views um, for fear of being bullied or yelled at or ostracized or um worse and we can see this in our wider political landscape and world and it really shows up in on the school campuses and is quite dangerous for a lot of a lot of folks so yeah kudos to u of t for creating this um wise intention and uh, so I'm linking down below an article that uh, gives it uh, is more of a Q&A with, um, with Randy Boyagoda and talks about the intentions of, of what they're going to do with this time and, and what they're going to co-create. But it's, yeah, first ever special appointed advisor on civil discourse. We need more. We need more. Um, so he he talks about the, uh, that it's much more than just the tactics or the certain strategies. Um, it is partly uh, can be often just described as a set of rules or an etiquette, and uh, he he says that his intention is more than just etiquette and politeness, although that can be helpful, um, but it's more to cultivate an open-minded discussion. And he says, we may disagree about abortion, Israel, or Barbie, but we're going to have a conversation about it and see where it gets us um, toward a shared goal of mutual understanding. And uh, in the article, uh, the Toronto Life article that I'm linking, uh, the interviewer asks really good questions about, you know, well, what if, what if it's this? And what if it's, remember this situation? Where, you know, and he has very skillful answers about them. Uh, for instance, he says here, civility doesn't, being civil doesn't mean participating in every argument a person only has so much energy and time in the day and if you feel like an argument has reached a point of staleness or redundancy you can check out so um you know he's not saying that we always have to participate in in all these conversations i really like this point if you're protesting to have your voice heard that makes good sense to me, he says. 
if you're protesting to drown out someone else's voice, I'm not as convinced. I thought that was interesting. I've been reflecting on that myself, you know, when I attend rallies and protests and or protest just in a conversation, um, you know, is it to share something that's a, a really true deep value or is it to like silence somebody else? That's a good question. <laughs> so, of course, civil discourse immediately brought to mind the Buddha's teaching on wise speech, right speech, the Eightfold Path, but also in our precepts of five precepts of five gifts of uh, that we offer to each other of being skillful and being someone that is uh, safe to be with or no, not necessarily, uh, has the intentions to be <laughs> skillful. Uh, they're still can often be harm done. So wise speech is a very important part of the Dharma. And uh, so one of the links I'll put down below this recording is to a talk I did on here two years ago. Um, no, longer than that. Well, whatever. A while ago, it was during the pandemic, and um, uh, that goes a little bit further into wise speech. But I wanted to talk tonight about something I've been thinking about that, and I wondered what the Buddha thought about um, wise listening. <laughs> wise listening the other part of wise speech and very helpful to give it a little turn and reflect on it, it, that as being part of wise speech is there skillful and wise listening internally and externally listening to others in a skillful way listening to our inner dialogue our inner sensations whoa just buzzed out there um if i stop the video and put it back on it clears up so i'm still here one sec and i'm back yeah uh so why is listening and i was thinking about the the aspects of why speech and what they look like in terms of listening. Hmm. So why speech includes abstaining from false speech. Um, so speaking the truth, if you say it in the positive. And what does that look like when, when we're in a place of listening? You know, are we, if, if someone's speaking with us, are we hearing that that's their truth that they're speaking or are we saying well that's not true or oh you know we're kind of shutting down or editing the truth that they're speaking um and and internally you know are we and when we're speaking are we listening to see if it's uh if it's false speech or not and how much false speech is happening internally to ourselves like i'm never going to and i'm not and or i am <laughs> i'm going to be hmm. abstaining from slanderous speech is is also um and then in the positive would be speech that promotes harmony and friendship so what does that look like when we're listening if this was wise listening listening in a way that promotes friendship and harmony promotes kindness sincerity you know what kind of presence are we bringing to our listening or is our listening i i i have this sankara this groove it's it's a little lighter, but it's still a tendency. 
and I remember on the three month silent retreat, one of the teachers I named it and I don't know who, um, and I think they called it something like porcupine listening or something. We're always listening like, because there's this tendency for to be critical and to be listening for them, you know, not saying, not getting it right or doing something. Yeah, that uh, harsh, critical listening. And that's, that's, that's the third one, abstaining from harsh speech. So harsh listening, you can even have harsh listening. And I know this in myself, it's kind of like, listening to catch something not quite right or not how I think it should be or not how I want it to be or whatever. And it's really good to know that that's a tendency. And then it can be seen as what it is, a groove that can be transformed and not fed. <laughs> Or do we listen with patience, which would be the opposite of, um, it's the antidote to harsh speech is patience. Are we listening with patience or are we listening to like, say what we want to say? Hmm. And the fourth aspect of wise speech is um, abstaining from idle chatter uh, or gossip uh, or any, you know, things that lack purpose or depth or pointless chatter. Um, and this is particularly um, in the positive we can abstain from idle chatter by avoiding uh, some of the infinite ways that we are now bombarded with idle chatter <laughs> on uh, news media and the plethora of devices to which we're plugged into. Um, so it requires some discernment and uh, protecting the sense doors to see how much are we fueling and feeding sound bites of um, spicy, juicy, bits of stuff. So Joseph Goldstein says, uh, when we have the interest and alertness to look at it, we see that speech is a mirror of our minds. This is why silence can be helpful <laughs> and listening. Cultivating more listening internally and externally will help us to cultivate a, a more peaceful, skillful state of mind. These are directly related. In the state of our mind, if it's in turmoil and angst and, and mm, idleness, etc., uh, that will can show in our speech very easily, as he says. And in the Sam Samyutta Nikaya, the Buddha said it this way, every person is born with an ax in their mouth. Can you hear that the dogs are just having a brawl? Speaking of speech, wow. There you go. That's what's a little mirror of life right now. <laughs> so true. Um, okay. Every person is born and every Chihuahua is born with an ax in their mouth. A fool who uses abusive language cuts themselves and the other with that ax. Very good. So it, we're, it's so easy to, you know, when we're hurt or angry or to just want to lash out at others and to 
see and understand how that harms us at the same time. And uh, listening internally, externally, pausing, um, understanding if it's the right time, et cetera, uh, can save a lot of um, dogfights. Hafiz, the poet, said it this way, the words you speak become the house you live in. So on listening, the Buddha said this, this is in the um, Anguta, Anguttana Nikaya. There are these five rewards in listening to the Dharma he's talking about, but these apply which five? One hears what one has not heard before. One clarifies what one has heard before. One gets rid of doubt. One's views are clarified or made straight. And one's mind grows serene. These are five rewards. Um, he, in particular, he's talking about listening to the Dhamma. If we understand that all things are Dhamma, <laughs> these are five rewards of wise listening. Hmm. I'm just debating if I want to go there. Um, no. So, pausing in so many instances, and especially with speech, because it's often our first response you know before we act we 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 often use our words you know whether it's writing something quickly in a response on social media or you know, all the ways that we communicate written form as well texting something off ching <laughs> without a pause oh boy um so pausing in the pause, we're listening. Listening to the reactivity, listening to the story, perhaps listening to what others are saying. Um, and similarly, being aware of bodily sensations. So in that pause, in that inner listening, and part of that is we might not be able to untangle our intention of, of what we're going to say. But we can access what sensations are happening in the body, even if the sensation is numbness. Like, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm going to I'm going to knock this one out of the ballpark and let it fly, you know. So, yeah, there's a lot more in the other mm, talk that I put a link to about wise speech, but I really wanted to focus tonight on wise listening um, and how that relates to uh, skillful civil discourse and wise speech in the long run needs to include this kind of listening. Uh, so there's a, a poem to before we practice from Rosemary Watola Trummer. <laughs> uh, on her daily poems that you can subscribe to. Uh, I'll put the link below. Uh, You can, you know, buy a person a coffee 
what you know to support their work mm, so i do this often with rosemary and i i sent a note saying that um that regular students or regular people that uh, attend when I say, and the poem is by, <laughs> they fill in the blank, Rosemary Watola Tromer, because I cite her so often. So here she is. And this one's called Remembering to Listen. She starts by uh, sharing a quote from Wayne Mueller, who says, I listen for the hidden wholeness, wisdom, and grace. That's good. So there's a, a nice little takeaway for this practice of wise listening. Listen for the hidden wholeness, the wisdom, and the grace. Okay, Rosemary says, I've forgotten how to listen for the hidden wholeness, trained by the ring of the phone and the morning alarm and the unheard bells of the day that say, go, go, go. I've forgotten how to be still, to empty, to unexpect. Today, though it is May, the green world is covered by snow. It's one way the world learns to unknow itself. My teacher reminds me how the deepest healing can only take place in the quiet, the still, the great awake. I know she is right but it is the kind of knowing that is too certain of itself. As I walk, I open my hands to let the snow land there. I watch the flakes melt. For a moment, I almost think I can hear them. For a moment, I forget who is doing the listening. So as we've been talking about listening wise listening i will be guiding mostly a a hearing meditation tonight uh, and uh, if you have a a practice that uh, resonates for you tonight if you want to rest with breath and open to hearing or um, do a meta practice of course do what you need And if we're lucky, we'll have the soundtrack of Chihuahuas fighting to um, practice with. So take some time to arrive in your posture. And as you do this, you're just taking a first first layer of listening to listen into your body and see what do you need. Do you need a, a, some more warmth or do you need to lay down for the practice? Do you, would you be supported by dimming your lights or turning away from the computer, etc.? So take a few moments to check in with any other supports you need for your posture, for your body. And when you're ready, Allowing stillness to feel like a welcoming, to let go of other distractions.
And she says, the deepest healing can only take place in the quiet and in the still, in the great awake. As you feel yourself landing into stillness or resting presence, take some time to just meet the sensations of the body and giving some space to any tension that's here that isn't needed right now to whatever degree it's not needed. So feeling into the muscles of the face and widening the forehead, letting the lower jawbone feel heavy. And then taking your time, we'll have a few minutes of silence here together to just guide yourself down neck, chest, shoulders, arms, etc., all the way down to the feet, just noticing any tension and giving some awareness to what happens when it's met with awake awareness and kindness. So we're just grounding and relaxing for the first few minutes together. And as you begin to feel more presenced, grounded, relaxed, we'll now open to the experience of hearing that is happening, listening. At first, you might notice sounds that are nearby sound of my voice. Sounds in the room. Sounds outside.
And you might notice the felt experience of this way of listening. You might feel like kind of a, like turning the knob on a radio dial. There's kind of a looking, turning, reaching for different sounds. And the attention moves to where the sound is perceived to be coming from. Like picking up different channels and kind of a, a there's an active participation And then see what it's like to rest back and down into the body. Like the body is a microphone or a satellite dish. And is just resting right here, receiving vibration. You don't have to look for sounds or practice listening, it's already happening. Not only are the vibrations of listening meeting the eardrum, they're meeting the whole body. Another aspect of listening is to listen to the quality of that immediate experience. Is that knowing of different vibrations, sounds arising, passing in any given moment, some are experienced as pleasant some as unpleasant, and many sounds are neutral. If there's kind of a background hum or what feels like silence, there is actually sound there, but maybe it's quite neutral. So let's listen to that quality. With the unpleasant sounds, we often 
quickly develop aversion, not wanting that sound with pleasant can easily become desire, wanting more of that. And when things are pretty neutral, it's easy to space out. Another aspect of this listening meditation is to listen internally. So there can be awake awareness, also knowing the inner dialogue, the inner narration that's happening. And this can just be known. In see and listen to this arising, passing, inner dialogue, inner narration of every moment. Listening for the hidden wholeness, wisdom, and grace.
And then see if you can let go or open a little more to listen from a place of spaciousness. Very open or receptive. All these vibrations of listening are coming from a very spacious place and moving through. And for a moment, we might forget who is doing the listening. Listening is just happening. And I'll ring these three bells slowly with the space in between 
so we can practice listening to its arising, vibrating, following the sound in awake awareness until it fully ends into silence. Thank you for your practice and uh, check the links below to that. Um, the article is, is a, a good a good one and it's a Q and A, so it's it's not a big long wordy piece, um, but you might find it interesting to explore a bit more about uh, civil discourse. Um, so. When in doubt, um, wait and listen and pause. We're so quick to reply to things, and um, it takes a, takes a moment, and sometimes it takes days or longer until you can really be skillful. So um, silence, why silence? Uh, hey, thanks for joining us.